Welcome to Truckee Talks. Well, it's November, and this time of year, what Truckee usually talks about is the weather. And that's a great thing, because on today's show, we've got a very special guest with us. We'll be talking about the weather in just a second, but I'd like to introduce to all of you Mark McLaughlin. Mark, it is a privilege to have you on the show. Thanks, Maya. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. Mark, you're a pretty distinguished guest here. We don't usually have this long of an introduction, but uh, I want to point out that you've been a recipient of the Nevada State Press Writing Award for the, the years 1993 through 1997. That's very impressive. You're Far West Ski Association Bill Berry Writing Award. You're the author of feature columns, Weather Window, and Sierra Stories. And in the Sierra Stories, of course, you've put those together in your two books here, Sierra Stories, True Tales of Tahoe, Volumes 1 and 2. But these are really great books. Uh, these oh, are thank you. fun to go through. It's real history of our uh, area, of our region. Mm -hmm. And uh, well written. Really oh, thank you. I read. appreciate that. Uh, and of course, you're a university lecturer, and uh, you've written over 100 published articles. You've been on national TV, and now we've got you here in our very own studios at Channel 6. Hey, <laughs> it's <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> this is exciting. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I want to talk about weather with you, Mark, and, and that's really okay. your background. Before we get into the weather, though, tell us how you got involved with weather. Um, well, I'm kind of a weather freak, and uh, I was raised in Philadelphia. And uh, they only average 20 inches of snow there a year, <laughs> and that was insufficient for me. <laughs> but uh, I still remember when I was a kid, I would used to, in Philadelphia, with four inches of snow, all schools are closed. So I would make predictions when school would be closed for the next day. But I would be so excited about it, I would just spend all night watching the street light, waiting for the snow to come. And when about two or three inches piled up along the sidewalks and everything, I'd shovel all my neighbors' walkways and put all the snow in front of my house. <laughs> so I think my dad was glad to see me leave when I finally did. We would have snow in front of our house in April when everybody else's lawns are already up. Now, you, you live know. here in Tahoe. I live on North, uh, Carnelian Bay, yeah. So you don't have to pile up anybody else's snow. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> it's all here for you. Exactly. Let's talk about last year's winter. Okay. Um, it was a pretty heavy-duty winter, and I think the thing that impacted us the most is that it just seemed to go on forever. Yes, it did. Um, well, one thing that I have to point out is <coughs> we always, the National Weather Service and the various climate agencies always try to make long-range forecasts. It's very difficult. It's very elusive. Uh, last year's strong El Nino event in the Pacific gave the National Weather Service the opportunity to make a long, winter-long forecast and they predicated this on data from historical El Nino events and looking at historic weather patterns. So they said, Southern California is going to be wetter than normal. The Pacific Northwest is going to be drier than normal. And they were able to schematic it out and do the whole country. And the wonderful thing that happened last year at when it was all said and done, if you took that forecast that the National Weather Service had put together, and then you took the weather data that had actually occurred at the finally at the end of the water year, and you laid it on top, it was almost a perfect match. So for the first time in history, the National Weather Service was able to put a long-range seasonal outlook forecast out there and hit the bullseye. So all that griping about weather forecasters not knowing what they're talking about is starting to go by the wayside? Well, it, it, the irony is, with a strong El Nino event, whereas this year we're getting into a moderate to strong La Nina event, mm -hmm. you can make a long-range prediction that has the potential and the likelihood of being accurate, whereas if they're trying to tell you what's going to happen in five days, they won't, still won't be able to do it. <laughs> it, it has to be a long trend kind of a thing, and it adds up, the numbers add up. You can't say one big storm here or five little ones. It's all, when it's all said and done, how the numbers have actually come together. Well, now, we're going to be talking about the difference, and uh, hopefully you're going to explain to us mm -hmm. in terms we'll understand, the difference between El Nino and La Nina. We're mm -hmm. hearing these terms a lot. Last year, there was so much talk of El Nino that I think we got sick of hearing about it until the weather actually hit. And well, and the thing is, California spent tens of millions of dollars in anticipation of this last year's strong El Nino event, mm -hmm. and it still cost us $500 million in damage. To clean it up. To clean it up and flood events and things of this nature. So uh, it was really, the thing what happened was El Nino events and La Nina events are oceanic, atmospheric um, scenarios. Let me, let me use the blackboard here just a little bit. And uh, my cartographic and mapping skills are absolutely terrible. But let's just put North America up like this. And then we have South America coming down, excuse me, Central America. And then we have South America down here. 
And what we usually have, let's put Australia way out here, and this map is not to scale, <laughs> and it's not perfectly done, you I must admit. You don't use this to fly to Australia, no, folks. please you'll don't. You'll never get there. <laughs> um, but there's two things, and I'll make this very basic and very simple. In general, in the atmosphere over the northern hemisphere, it generally tends to be low pressure over the Australian continent. Lower pressure means rising air. Rising air creates a vacuum near the surface. Nature abhors <coughs> vacuums. It will send air to fill that vacuum. So we have low pressure over Australia, and we tend to have high pressure over here in our part of the world. So in a typical year, the high pressure will send air and the air masses towards the low pressure to fill in this vacuum. And when it does that, these prevailing winds will take the top layer of the ocean's waters and send it to the west. The moisture. The, the warm water that's been heated by the sun. Mm -hmm. So as that water moves that way, it creates a very warm body of water. That's why, and this is a little side thing, we have hurricanes here in our part of the world. They call them typhoons in the Asian part of the world. And their typhoons will go 200, 250 mile an hour wind gusts and such. They're much, much more powerful, and that's because they have shallow ocean and all this warm air, warm water, excuse me, that continues to flow in that direction. And an El Nino event means the atmosphere changes. We get low pressure developing here, high pressure picks up over here, and what that does is it reverses the wind flow, which reverses the ocean currents, and it changes our weather patterns here in California, might be hard to see, we're up in this neck of the woods. This new flow coming in an unusual situation, which is an El Nino that only happens every three to four years or so, and will begin to bring storms in primarily to Southern California, and the Northwest will be dry. So they'll be dry there, they'll be wet here. In a La Nina event, um, it's the pressures have reverted back to the normal mm -hmm. with uh, low pressure in the west and high pressure over us, but the ocean temperatures themselves have really cooled down below normal. And in La Niñas, with colder than normal temperature, ocean temperatures do not always follow an El Nino right on its heels, but this year it did. It does happen, so, but it's a little unusual. And what the El Ni La Nina will tend to do will change this pattern and can tend to bring in storms into the Pacific Northwest, giving them above normal. They're naturally wet anyway. Mm. So there will be wetter than normal, and this year's forecast will be for Southern California, drier than normal. And these will probably be almost a guarantee now that this will happen. I'll ask you in a minute just where we fall into this, but you mentioned some very primary changes here w in the creation of El Niños or La Niños, mm -hmm. one of them being the change of pressure from low to high, Right. The other being the surface temperature of the ocean changing. What causes those base changes? Why would the ocean temperature change? Well, it's called ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And the oscillation is that seesaw effect that we're talking about here, and no one can tell you why exactly that happens. It's been going on probably for millennia, on and on and off. Mm -hmm. The only time we just started most young people won't even know this, but we weren't even talking about El Ninos before the winter of 1982-83, which was the most powerful recorded El Nino until just last year, and created hundreds of millions of dollars of damage in California. And once the media grabbed that El Nino, which means the little boy, right. and it's named, and I'll just clarify this, when we talk about how these waters are taken away in an El Nino event and shift shifted off like that, where in a traditional pattern, what happens is when the, uh, that surface water moving to the west allows cold, nutrient-rich water to upwell off the north coast of western South America, and fishermen go out to harvest anchovy and other mm -hmm. types of cold water fish. And when the El Nino occurs, and you usually start seeing it in November or December, and these ocean, and instead of having the warm water going off to Australia and letting cold water up well, it, it reverses. And warm water comes flowing back towards northern South America and off the, uh, the Central American coast. And when you, the fishermen go out to catch these cold water fish, 
they're not there because the ocean has gotten so much warmer, mm -hmm. they've had to go off. Mm -hmm. And since the fishermen, these are mostly Catholic nations in South America, and the fishermen are going out in December near Christmas, they said, ah, it's El Nino, named for the Christ child, the, the little Jesus. boy. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a very anecdotal name, mm -hmm. but now it's the big thing. Now, yeah. we're talking about La Nina, and here we are in Truckee Tahoe. What is this going to mean to us, Mark? Uh, statistically, in our area, it will be average to slightly below average, will be the statistic. But as most of us know who live here, uh, our averages are strictly the means, the, the numerical means or averages between extremes. Mm -hmm. And just off the top of my head, I'll just s half a dozen La Ninas in this century. We had 1906 07. 884 inches of snow. That's 73 and a half feet. That is still the all-time Sierra record. <laughs> then it came, then we had 1924, mm -hmm. which is the driest winter in the Sierra history, mm -hmm. only 17 inches of precipitation. And then we had a series of flood years. We had 1950, 1955, both uh, November, December oriented uh, flood situations on the Truckee River, both from La Nina influenced winters. Mm -hmm. And then we went into 90, 1975, 76, 76, 77, a two-year very extreme drought. Right. So when you look at it that way, it's a push on this kind of a thing. But what they'll have to say is from San Francisco north, the chances are better than average because every year it's a roll of the dice. It's a 50-50 chance for an average year, mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. But this year, the dice is loaded to be wetter than normal, north of Tahoe, Truckee, and this into this direction, and then drier to the down south. And once again, just like in El Nino's, which is a similar kind of thing, but in reverse, we're in this really, it's kind of a gray area, and it's hard to say with certainty exactly what this winter will bring, but I would tend to say that I would look for a wet fall, November, December, and then a kind of a more traditional winter which we doesn't seem we've had very many traditional <laughs> yeah, winters what recently. What would a traditional winter look a like? A traditional winter means you have a series of two or three frontal systems that come mm -hmm. in, give us two to three feet of snow total, then high pressure regime comes in and keeps us dry for two weeks, two and a half weeks, till another little batch of a few storms come in, right. and we'll add up our numbers and we'll have that. We haven't had that kind of a pattern in a long time. Uh, and that's kind of what this year would tend to be predicted to be, but. Like I said, uh, that's why I'm a weather historian. People <laughs> ask me, what's a weather historian? I say, I will tell you what the weather has been from yesterday back 150 years. And my accuracy rate is very good. Isn't that cheating, though? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's plenty of guys out there trying to make forecasts. <laughs> that's right. So that's right. Well, I mean, it sounds like it could be a good year for skiers, though. We get some snow base down, and then we get some clear days. Yes. Uh, what is worrying me right now, uh, the pattern that is beginning to set up, and I'll just point this out. Very briefly, uh, even today I drove in in the snow coming here, mm -hmm. but we only picked up a few inches, and there's ver it's powder. There's very little moisture content mm -hmm. in there, and only skiers care about snow. It's <laughs> everybody else cares about water content. Right. You know, and that's one thing. When you measure precipitation, you measure it in a rain gauge, mm -hmm. and one inch of rain will equal one inch of water, but you take snow and you melt it down, and in the Sierra, it is generally one foot of snow will equal about one inch of water. Mm -hmm. And then you add up all the inches. Mm -hmm. Last year, at uh, the, uh, the eight station Sierra Index, which is a, a group of stations that are placed throughout the um, water sheds of the Sierra, and then they're all averaged together to get a Sierra average. Last year, we had 84 inches of precipitation. And the record, modern record, is the winter of 1982-83, and they had 88. Oh, we can remember so that So we winter. were very, very close. Yeah. Very, very close. Yeah. Um, but what is happening this year, and it is kind of a scary trend if it continues, is, and this will give us that same exact pattern that we were talking about. If these storms, like they're doing now, just like today, we got the tail end. If they start coming through, and here it is, Northern California, getting very wet in Oregon and Washington, plus, 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 mm -hmm. and we're just getting the tails a couple inches here and there, dry to the south, and here we are right in that area mm -hmm. again. And we're going to want to get some of these storms to come a little bit further south if we can, or 
what's going to happen that will make up the difference. Otherwise, it's going to be a drought winter. Or if we get a tropical flow, which has happened in La Niña's, it's a what we call our Pineapple Express, mm -hmm. what we have in El Niño's that comes kind of from Hawaii, it seems, even though it's, it's further to the west, the same thing happens up here to the north. They tend to get flood events in Oregon and Washington. And uh, that's how the big numbers happen. In that storm of 1955, it was only a seven-day storm, but we picked up 30 inches of rain. And those numbers will carry over. Even if the rest of the year is dry, you're already way ahead. But that's not what we want. I mean, as humans, we can't use tremendous amounts of rainfall. Right. We like moderate amounts of snow, preferably before weekends and before the holiday <laughs> season for skiers, if we can get it. But once again, we don't control the weather. We just observe it. Now, you mentioned that last year the National Weather Service was pretty accurate in their yeah. overall prediction. Mm -hmm. What are they predicting overall? You mentioned the, the wetter up here, the drier down here. Can they narrow it down to our region? No, this no? is what they, the only data that they're trying to use is San Francisco, mm -hmm. and then you'll extrapolate that up into the Sierra, mm -hmm. and San Francisco runs in the 90s of that, of 90-some um, percent of an average winter, mm -hmm. which is pretty close to normal. Yeah. And you can't complain about normal. Normal brings us 35 feet of snow on the Sierra. <laughs> so. A normal winter is okay around here. Well, Mark, let's talk about that for a little bit. You mentioned uh, weather in the Sierra, and it really does seem we make our own weather up here, it feels like. It, regardless of what's going on in the Sacramento Valley below us, or even in Reno, we have our own climate going on up here. Why is that? Well, as far as the Sierra Nevada is concerned, uh, Sacramento and San Francisco does not exist. <laughs> the Sierra Nevada is sitting here, and the ocean is right there. And I'll make this very fairly you clear and as briefly as possible. But I love to point this out because people look at the mountains and they say, oh, well, it's wet there and it's dry here because the mountains stop the snow, mm -hmm. right? And it, in a very basic way, that is what happens. But in reality, and we'll just make this real easy, and I'm going to use all round numbers, too. We're just going to make this as easy as possible. Let's consider this to be the Sierra Nevada. It's a north-south aligned mountain range. We have a westerly Pacific flow. That means all storms off of the Pacific meet this as a barrier. It's a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. Let's make the top of the Sierra 10,000 feet high. Real easy. San Francisco and Sacramento are at sea level. Mm -hmm. Now, let us bring a storm system in out of the ocean. This has to be a saturated air mass to make this work. So we have a rainstorm coming in. And we're going to make it 50 degrees and raining in Sacramento. Now, this may seem like it's going to be complicated, but it's not. You'll watch. <laughs> as now long as this isn't a word problem, Mark. No, I'm it's not you. at all. And I hate mathematics, <laughs> so this is as basic as it gets. It's pouring rain in Sacramento, and it's 50 degrees. We have a saturated air mass. That air mass is now forced up the side of the Sierra, goes on its way over, and starts heading through Tahoe and then into the Nevada Basin where the saturated air mass is forced to rise up the west side of the Sierra, it will cool an average of three degrees for every thousand feet gained. So if we start at 50 degrees and we go up 10,000 feet, losing three degrees for every thousand, we're going to subtract 30 mm -hmm. degrees. So it will be 20 degrees up on the summit and snowing, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, as the air is cooled, Cool air cannot hold the moisture in it anymore, and it squeezes it out. And it heavy, heavy rain falls on the west slope until it finally turns to snow, and heavy snow making its way all the way up until finally it pops over the top. Mm -hmm. When it pops over the top, it, most of the moisture has been squeezed clean out of the air. So now it's considered to be a dry air mass. And let's bring it down. We know Reno's at 3,800 feet or so, but let's go south down towards Mono County where you can get closer to sea level mm -hmm. down here. Mm -hmm. And now we're 20 degrees at 10,000 feet. But dry air compresses as it is forced down, and it will warm 5 degrees for every 1,000 oh. feet it descends. So we're coming down 10,000 feet with 5 degrees. We're going to add 50 degrees to 20. So now it is 70 degrees on the east slope. Mm. And that is a temperature that's warm enough to take that either frozen snow or liquid rain and suck it back up into the atmosphere. And it will become an invisible water vapor, a gas, which has no precipitative value at all. 
so you will just get a blustery dry wind on the east side of the Sierra. Truckee is here at 5,800 feet. Truckee Ranger Station averages 33 inches of precipitation a year. So let's say 22 feet of snow and the balance is in rain. Blue Canyon on the <laughs> west slope, same exact elevation, 69 inches. It's virtually double. Huh. It's virtually double. And you know what I always say? We live on the dry side of the Sierra here in Truckee and in Lake Tahoe. If you put Truckee on the other side at the same elevation or you put Lake Tahoe on the other side of the Sierra at the same elevation, half the people wouldn't be living here because you would be increasing the rain and snowfall by a factor of more than two. Interesting. See? So why aren't there any ski hills over here? Well, <laughs> there aren't any ski hills because the mountains have been eroded down. The Sierra uh -huh. uplifted, and what we have is these quick, clear, right. precipitous drops. It's much more undulating as you go down on the west slope. And that is called orographic uplift, meaning you have the two ways of getting rain. Synoptic, meaning a wedge of cold air forcing air to rise and cool and condense the precipitation, or forcing it up over the mountains where it does that too. And fortunately for us in the Sierra, we get both. The synoptic event forcing the air to rise and then combined with the orographic uplift to produce enhanced precipitation mm. values. This has been a that very good learning experience. Right? I, I think I got it. Okay, I okay. think I got it. I'll give myself an A because okay. I understood <laughs> it. <laughs> and actually, that really clarifies a lot of interesting information for us. There, we struggle with the weather up here, not because we like it or dislike it. We know that weather comes with the deal. That's, that's, that's part right. of why we live here. I, low pressure gets me high, <laughs> and that's why I moved here. You have a bumper sticker that says <laughs> Well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to point out is east of the Sierra is Nevada. Uh -huh. Nevada is the driest state in the United States. Out of all 50, Nevada is the driest mm. because of this principle of a west flow and a mountain range blocking it off. And what's interesting is we're at where Nevada averages eight inches of precipitation a year on average rain and snow combined, and that's not very much. It will have an evaporation rate. What they do is they put pans of water out in the desert and they measure by month how much water is evaporated from the heat and the sun. Mm -hmm. And Nevada will average 65 inches in evaporation. They bring in eight, they give away 65, and what does that equal? A desert. It's a water deficit. Right. It will always be a desert. Of course, they keep piping our water down there. Well, of course they do. Well, Nevada <laughs> owns all of our water. Right, right. You know. Well, that's another story. All right, well, don't get me going on and that. And another show, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so let's say that our skiers in uh, Truckee and Tahoe may not be disappointed this year, but may really want to go where the snow is going to be. We've talked about the La Nina effect on the West Coast. Do they know, are they making any predictions in general about the United States and where else we might yes, go to find uh, the snow? Well, unfortunately, where the bulk of the snow is going to be is flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you wanted to go skiing, and I'd go Whistler and, and Vancouver up in that neck of the woods, and the, the Cascade Ranges are going to be fat with snow. and. Uh, we're a little bit behind right now, but of course, since the drought, every, a lot of ski areas have snow making. And I know everybody says, oh, snow making, snow making. But get it going, and then a little bit of natural fall on top, and people can have a good time. You can't expect to have a booming winter every year. We're ready for a drought. We're due for a drought. Bite your tongue. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just an observer. Oh, for the United States this year, and I can do this a little bit easier, we're going to be, if you can see that, Wetter than normal here, cold, snowy, and stormy in the north central part of the United States. Also up here in New England, and then this will tend to be dry and mild. And once again, we're in this limbo land where it's really hard to say, hard to say. with a, a, a computer model or numerical models, just, just kind of points to a, a normal year, even though those normal years have gone from the wettest to the driest, and it just averages that way to be normal. Mm -hmm. It tends to give us extreme weather. So it's a push. Well, we'll see how this year pans out. It'll be interesting to see if the uh, forecasts or predictions are as accurate this mm -hmm. year as they were last year. But it's the, it's the moderate to strong La Nina event that is giving us a signal. If we didn't have a La Nina, they would just be throwing averages all over the board. No enhanced values whatsoever. But this gives them a forecasting tool, which they're trying to use. This is all new stuff. It's exciting. It is exciting. Exciting. Uh, personally, I don't want to see weather forecasts to get very good. Weather is the last bastion 
of uncontrolled reality, right. and I like it that way. That's I'm a good kind point. of an anarchist, you know, and that's what I liked about Philadelphia. Snow shuts the city down. <laughs> I thought it was great. We couldn't let four inches of snow shut Trekkie no, down. No, We'd I never no. get anything <laughs> done. <laughs> if, if four inches of snow closed the school here, they wouldn't be going to school very often. That's right. <laughs> They'd be going to school in August or September. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to wrap up this part. And, Mark, this has just been really educational for me. I'm sure it has for our viewers as mm -hmm. well. This has been very, very good. I'm going to step back. We just have a few minutes left on the show and talk a little bit about you being a weather historian. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing trends that are changing, and we hear the terms global warming, we hear La Nina, El Nino. We're not really sure how those impact us. Are you seeing shifts? that are significant, or is it just sort of valleys and hills that we get through in cycles? Well, the professional community in this country is a minority. The Most of the scientists around the world uh, believe there is significant global warming occurring at this time, uh, more than likely very much enhanced by fossil fuel uh, emissions. And uh, could be a natural spike, but it's also being forced through. We've just the 80s was the warmest decade, oh, in, in, in thousands of years, and the 90s have already set up this way again. Mm -hmm. You know, hot and hot and hot, and it will be changing weather patterns. Um, uh, you'll even see that guy on television who's director of FEMA, and he'll say weather patterns are changing. Unequivocally, he says that. Now, for me, that's a dangerous thing to say. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the things I point out with Al Gore. Al Gore is on the side of the environment. He's trying to make people aware of what's going on. But it's a dangerous thing to jump on a train that's running with minimal amount of statistical background right. in such a short period of time. Personally, I believe that we have been in a climatic flux since the late 70s. And for the rest of our lifetimes, I think that the weather is going to be have all kinds of extreme variables, both for us here in North America and as a global ramifications. And the biggest thing that just came out of last year's uh, Kyoto Protocol, 1997, where most of the nations of the world are getting on board, the Western industrialized nations are being told by the rest of the world now to roll back emissions to 1990 mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the United States, we're sitting on our hands because we can. It's expensive to do these kinds of things. And we're having a lot of conflict trying to resolve it. And whether or not are Americans willing to maybe alter their lifestyle. Make the changes necessary. You know, one yeah. of the things we talk about how cheap gasoline is in this country. Mm -hmm. And we drive these very big vehicles now. We're contributing a lot to right. this. Um, I think it's a very real thing. Making a forecast of how it's going to be the rest of our lives or into the near future, very difficult very to difficult. say. Very difficult. And yeah. I appreciate not going into that territory. Yeah, exactly. We're going to have to wrap up the show, Mark. Okay. It's just been a pleasure having you on. Tell us about the book that you have coming out, and we'll put a plug oh, in for uh, that. Oh, that's right. I'm working on a, a train book coming out for next June. And I, I really haven't figured it out. I want to use uh, Wild West train stories or something. That's the working title. But okay. what it will be, a variety of very action-oriented, true stories about our local railroads and the Virginian okay. trucking and everything else. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll look forward to it. Mark McLaughlin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Keep your eye out for Mark's books in the bookstores. And uh, carry your umbrella, you never know, and make sure you've got your Sorrells in the back of the car. That's right. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you. We'll see you next time on Trekkie Talks.